Today, with the mighty avenging wrath of a nation conceived in freedom, America goes to war. To attack with fire and sword, with men and machines. To strike at the enemy on the wings of deadly fighting planes. To blast him off the seas, wherever he may be. To sweep him from the skies. Our courage is drawn from six generations of liberty-loving people. Our strength is power. Power which built the greatest industrial nation on earth. Power developed to run the engines of business and commerce. Power now needed to drive on the mighty weapons of modern war. The power most useful in mechanized warfare, power in its most efficient modern form, is diesel power, as found in the two-cycle diesel engine. The kind of power big enough to drive these mighty battle wagons. The story of diesel, the modern power, begins with man's first primitive source of energy, fire. To the men of ancient times, the art of making fire was as important and as difficult as life itself. One method was to strike together two stones, one of flint and the other containing iron in some form. Another method produced fire by rubbing two pieces of wood, one against the other. While the people of southeastern Asia many years ago learned to make fire by compressed air using an extraordinary contrivance known as the fire piston or fire syringe. This consisted of a hollow tube closed at one end and a round stick which could be inserted into the top of the tube. Tinder was placed usually at the bottom of the round stick. Then when this stick or plunger was driven down quickly, the tinder took fire and burned. Repeating this action, slowed down, let's see what happens inside this fire-making apparatus. As the round stick or plunger moves down the tube, the air in the tube is trapped, confined to a smaller and smaller space. And finally, the tinder at the end of the plunger ignites. Result? Fire through compression. But why? To find the answer to this question, let's construct a modern fire syringe. Turn the apparatus upside down and put a couple of thermometers in convenient places. One of these thermometers will record the room temperature and the other will register the temperature of the air inside the cylinder. Next, we add an instrument for measuring the air pressure inside the cylinder. And now, we've transformed the primitive fire-making device into a modern scientific apparatus. The pressure gauge reads zero, and both thermometers are at room temperature, 74 degrees. Now we start compressing the air. As the piston goes up, the pressure rises. The temperature outside of the cylinder remains the same, but inside the cylinder, the more the air is compressed, the higher the temperature goes. Now, the air in the cylinder is hot enough to boil water. Higher and higher go temperature and pressure. Now it's hot enough to melt tin. Until finally, the air in the cylinder is compressed into about one-sixteenth of the space it occupied before we started compressing it. At this point, the pressure and the temperature of the air inside the cylinder are extremely high. And if a mist of oil should be sprayed into it, here's what would happen. Now let us repeat this action in slow motion. Oil is sprayed into the cylinder. It catches fire and burns. Temperature and pressure increase, driving the piston downward. And so we've seen demonstrated a basic scientific principle, the fact that when air is compressed, it gets hot. Now let's pause to examine another basic scientific principle one which is best understood through an experiment. A piece of rubber sheeting is stretched over the mouth of a glass container. The glass is heated, and the rubber sheeting puffs out like a balloon. This is because air expands when it is heated. So now, let's apply this second principle. First, the air in the cylinder becomes hot from compression. Then it is heated to a much higher temperature by the burning oil increasing the pressure so it pushes the piston down. 
Now let's convert this apparatus into a mechanism which will apply these two scientific principles in such a way as to provide mechanical power. First, let's take away the pressure gauge and the thermometers and strengthen the walls of the cylinder to withstand continued high temperatures and pressures. Now we'll need a couple of pipes or manifolds. One to bring fresh air into the cylinder and the other to carry the burned gases out of it. Also, a couple of valves to cork the air in the cylinder while it's being compressed and while the oil burns. Next, we install a better atomizer, which we will call the injector unit. Then, in order to transform the up and down motion of our piston into more convenient turning motion, we replace the piston rod with a crankshaft and connecting rod. But one thing more is needed, something which will keep speed uniform between power impulses. So we add a heavy flywheel. And to protect and support our apparatus, we add a housing and a base. Now let's see how this mechanism works. First, the intake valve opens and the piston moves downward. Fresh air is drawn into the cylinder. Now the intake valve closes, tightly corking the air in the cylinder, and we drive the piston upward in its compression stroke. The injector unit sprays fuel oil onto the top of the cylinder. The oil burns, pushing the piston down. Now the exhaust valve opens, the piston moves up, and the gases resulting from the burned oil are forced out. This is called a four-stroke or four-cycle diesel engine because it has four strokes to each cycle. Intake, compression, power, exhaust. Intake, compression, power, exhaust. Intake, compression, power, exhaust. One of the most interesting and important parts of our engine is the atomizer or injector unit. Let's see why. The diesel engine operates on a compression ratio of 16 to 1. As we've seen, this means that the air inside of the cylinder is compressed into 1 16th of the space it normally requires, building up a pressure of 500 to 600 pounds per square inch. Against this tremendous pressure, the injector unit must drive fuel into the cylinder with such force that it spreads almost instantaneously to all parts of the combustion chamber. Here's how the injector unit works. First of all, it's made up of a pump, an injection valve, and the injector nozzle. The injector pump presses down on the oil until it reaches a pressure of from 15 to 20,000 pounds per square inch. The pressure opens the injector valve and forces a small quantity of oil through the injector nozzle into the cylinder. The fuel must burn quickly, so it's pushed into the cylinder through tiny holes in the injector nozzle which are no bigger than the diameter of a small needle. These break it up into a fine fog or spray. And so efficient is this remarkable mechanism that it forces oil through the highly compressed air in the cylinder at a rate of over 780 miles per hour, 13 miles a minute. That's twice as fast as a racing car and even faster than the fastest airplane. The injector unit also controls the speed of the diesel engine. The more fuel oil sprayed into the cylinder, the greater the speed, and the amount of fuel entering the cylinder is varied by a sliding bar, which is connected to the throttle of the engine. This bar engages a gear, which is attached to the plunger of the injector pump, so that when the bar is moved back and forth, the pump plunger turns. And so, the turning action of the plunger increases or decreases the effective stroke of the pump, thus varying the amount of fuel entering the cylinder. In other words, the injector unit is called upon to do a big job in a very small amount of space and time. It is able to do that job only because of the amazing precision with which it's fitted together. And every unit must pass this exacting test on a machine which checks accuracy to millionths of an inch. To illustrate the precision required in the manufacture of the injector unit, let us place a human hair under a microscope. Now suppose that hair were split into about 125 equal parts. One 125th of that hair is equal to the clearance between the plunger and the barrel of the injector unit pump. This remarkable device was the result of the activities of many scientists and engineers 
working to solve the problem of properly injecting the fuel into the cylinders. It's made up of many finely machined parts turned from the best steel available by highly skilled workmen. The injector unit must not fail. It's indeed the heart of the diesel engine and it must pump oil into the cylinder many thousands of times during each hour of operation. And to successfully perform this job, it must be as nearly perfect as it can be made. The first diesels had only one cylinder, but it was found that one cylinder diesel engines could not provide sufficient power for most operations. So, more cylinders were added. There were two cylinder engines, three cylinder, four cylinder, six-cylinder engines, engines with eight, twelve, or sixteen cylinders. For many purposes, the four-stroke or four-cycle diesel engine was the most efficient and most economical engine in existence. But for other purposes, it was too heavy. It had to be big and heavy to withstand the high temperatures and extreme pressures of the compression and power strokes. But the great weight and size of the engine was not needed for the intake and exhaust strokes. Yet the engine spent half of its time merely pumping air in and out of the cylinders. How could they eliminate the pump stroke? That was the problem the engineers set out to solve. And research and experiment resulted in the development of a pump or blower to take the place of these two pump strokes. This innovation called for an important change in the engine. For now it was necessary to move the intake manifold down so it encircled the base of the cylinder. And fresh air was forced in by the blower through a number of openings in the cylinder wall. The intake opening in the top of the cylinder was no longer needed. So during the fraction of a second that the piston was at the bottom of its stroke, the new pump or blower forced clean air in at the bottom of the cylinder. And the clean air rushing in forced the burn gases out through the exhaust valve at the top of the cylinder. So that every time the piston went up, it compressed air. And every time it went down, it provided power. Our engine had become a two-stroke or two-cycle diesel engine. Compression, power. Compression, power. And so, the two-stroke diesel engine furnished almost twice as much power as a four-stroke diesel engine the same size, because it had twice as many power strokes. And now, let's have a look at the pump or blower, which has made our two-cycle diesel possible. The two rapidly turning rotors of the blower, which are now seen in slow motion, trap the air between themselves and the wall of the blower, forcing the air through into the cylinder. It was found that to give an even flow of air without noise, the rotors should be curved in this unusual fashion. But machining the rotors in this way presented a difficult problem, because every inch of the outside surface of the rotors had to fit exactly to the blower walls. These problems were solved, however, and as a result, the two-cycle or two-stroke diesel engine became an accomplished fact. This new engine was smaller. It weighed less per horsepower. The four-cycle engine was still extremely valuable for certain types of installations. But where more power per pound of engine was needed, the new two-cycle diesel promised great things. And so, testing and experiment continued. The engine was further perfected. And then, in 1933, research engineers were ready to show the new diesel to the public. At the Century of Progress Exposition in Chicago, two 600-horsepower, two-cycle diesels were put to work in the exhibit power plant. They operated with unprecedented economy and efficiency. Then, in 1934, came dramatic proof of performance. The new diesel engine powered the first railroad diesel streamliner, the Burlington Pioneer Zephyr which streaked from Denver to Chicago in 13 hours and five minutes. This was progress. American travelers wanted to ride on diesel streamliners, and progressive American railroads were quick to demand the diesel locomotives that General Motors had already begun to manufacture. First came the mainline crack passenger locomotives, made in 2,000 horsepower units, guaranteeing smooth service during any emergency because they can be coupled together 
to provide 4,000 or even 6,000 horsepower engines. Next, diesel switcher locomotives, railway yard workhorses. They are made in two sizes, 600 horsepower and 1,000 horsepower. The combination of two 1,000 horsepower switchers brought about diesel transfer locomotives of the type shown here in the yards of the Illinois Central Railroad. They find extensive use in transfer service and on spur freight lines. But the most important railroad job, the greatest challenge to diesel power, is hauling freight. In 1940, a new General Motors freight locomotive tested over 83,000 miles under all kinds of conditions, made possible a new railroad performance goal, freight hauling on passenger schedules. And since Pearl Harbor, this goal has been achieved. Over the lands of the Santa Fe Trail, Western railroads are moving arms and ammunition to the Pacific coast in record time. Today, in countless ways, Diesel railroad power has reinforced democracy's wartime economy. Each diesel railroad unit has released from two to four steam locomotives for other wartime work. Each diesel engine has stepped up the efficiency of America's communication system, the very lifeline of the United Nations. While it was transforming America's railroads, Diesel power had already begun to bring efficiency and economy onto our highways. Faster getaway, better hill climbing ability, more mileage per fuel gallon, easy accessibility and direct fuel injection. These advantages have made the operation of diesel trucks increasingly profitable, have put 3,500 General Motors diesel powered buses traveling 200 million miles per year on the highways of the nation and the streets of our cities to guarantee continued transportation service to wartime workers and have provided a 50% saving in the petroleum needed for our gigantic transportation problems. And on our water highways, at the service of our merchant fleet, diesel engines power the tankers that carry fuel the fire boats that protect our docks, the dredges that keep our harbors open for navigation. Yes, on sea and on land, General Motors diesel engines with more than four million horsepower have provided a great super force of energy to develop our natural resources. Increasing by 25% the efficiency of machines that move earth for our highways, helping the farmer perform his job of feeding the nation, matching the strength of fabled Paul Bunyan's great blue ox to make lumber for our homes and our public buildings, heightening the pressure which mines the metal for our factories and our war machines, pumping oil from the depths of the earth itself. Diesel power has played no small part in giving this country the unparalleled productive capacity which now enables it to become the arsenal of democracy. And it was fitting indeed that American engineers who developed the General Motors two-cycle diesel engine should also make it available to the world, that American mass production methods should now be able to supply the new two-cycle diesel engines in sufficient quantity to arm the fighting forces of the United Nations. Not only in the General Motors electromotive plant, where diesel locomotives are manufactured in their entirety from rails to roof, but at Cleveland Diesel, where marine models are made, and at Detroit Diesel, where the small series of General Motors diesel engines are built. Mass production methods based on the principle of interchangeable parts, which can go into two, four, six, eight, twelve, or sixteen cylinder engines from fifteen to fifteen hundred horsepower now make possible uninterrupted assembly line production of diesel engines for war. Now, diesel power means victory power. In the Navy, the improved two-cycle General Motors diesel gives the American submarine great speed and range. 
Diesel engines power submarine chasers, so vital in our coast patrol. Mine sweepers and mine layers. Fleet tugs, powerful enough to tow a wounded dreadnought out of battle range. Coast Guard patrol boats of many types. Lance light destroyers. Diesel engines also supply auxiliary power to cruisers and battleships, the giants of our naval warfare. In spite of their great power and efficient operation, diesel engines are essentially so simple that the men in the Navy quickly learn how to operate and care for them. In fact, all our men in the service, in the Navy and in the Army as well, have learned that they can depend on the efficiency of diesel power for hundreds of jobs. From moving artillery to generating power for searchlights and anti-aircraft batteries. And finally, as a symbol of victory itself comes the General Motors two-cycle British Valentine tank. Rolling off the assembly lines of America's arsenal to the armies of the United Nations, roaring across the battlefields of desert or steppe, with power and stamina, with fast getaway for surprise attack, Diesel, the modern power, will outponcer the poncers. Yes, our strength is power, diesel power, to roll the mechanized weapons of warfare to victory.